Welcome back to Chem 1000, Introduction to Chemical Principles. We're going to begin here with a look at really the foundations of chemistry, developing the fundamental concepts, skills, and language that you'll need to succeed throughout the remainder of this course and really throughout any chemistry course that you'll take moving forward. So we're going to begin with atoms, molecules, and ions, really focusing in on these essential molecular level species that we think about to understand chemical processes. And this is based on the second chapter of the Chemistry OpenStax textbook, second edition, and that's the textbook for Chem 1000 at this point. So make sure you've read through that either before or after watching these videos to really solidify your understanding of these topics. Just to give a quick outline of where we're going from here, uh, we're going to begin by looking at atomic structure and symbolism, so the foundational particles of the atom and how we describe those and how we talk about different types of atoms. We're then going to move to chemical formulas, which is a primary way we describe molecular structures or structures involving more than one atom type, we might say, encompassing both ionic and molecular compounds. Then we'll move to looking at the periodic table, which is the way we organize elements in chemistry and think about relationships between elements. Mendeleev's really fundamental discovery that elements behave in a periodic manner with respect to atomic number, in other words, they display kind of oscillatory patterns in their properties, uh, was really the foundation of modern chemistry and allows us to condense a very large amount of just pure information in terms of the number of elements that exist in nature into a much smaller number of patterns. Then we're going to move into talking about molecular and ionic compounds, distinguishing between the two, how we think about them at the molecular level, their similarities, their differences, and in the nature of bonding in these compounds and the fundamental concepts there. And then finally, we're going to talk about chemical nomenclature, which tends to get a bad reputation among students for some legitimate reasons actually related to memorization and just there's a lot of information here. There are a lot of algorithms here to process. I'm going to try to make the argument to you that nomenclature actually does serve some valuable purposes. Nomenclature is really built on structure. Structure informs our nomenclature systems, and names provide us with very important structural information. So expert chemists don't just name stuff to name stuff. There's actually structural information and structural patterns built into our naming systems that we use um, to really condense, again, a lot of structural information into a small package and then unpack a name into properties and structure and the ability, for example, to make predictions about chemical behavior. So that's where we're going. A lot of information in this first lesson, but it's really going to serve as the foundation of everything we do moving forward. So let's begin with atomic structure and symbolism. And the first thing that we really just need to note is that the atom has an internal structure to it. So atoms are the building blocks of matter, but within the atom we find different types of particles. At the center of the atom we have the nucleus. And one point to make right off the bat is that the nucleus is extremely small. If we imagine that the atom was the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be at the center and would be about the size of a blueberry. So amazingly small considering the size of the atom as a whole. And this makes the point also that atoms are mostly empty space. It's electrostatic attraction and repulsion that really forms the, the space taking up properties of the atom. Uh, most of it is empty space filled with electron clouds with a very small, small nucleus at the center. In the nucleus, we find two types of particles, which we collectively refer to as nucleons. The proton, which is positively charged, and the neutron, which has a neutral charge. Around the, the nucleus, in a much larger volume, we find electrons. And electrons are much lighter than protons and neutrons. We can see that if we look at the masses here. And they have negative charge. So they have opposite charge of the protons in the nucleus. And that attraction between the opposite charges of the proton and electron, on some level, holds the atom together. So these exact numbers are not super important to keep in mind. One thing I'll point out about the charge, so this is the charge listed in units of coulombs, but you'll also see um, this referred to as the elementary charge. 
and it's assigned the letter E. And so for a proton, you'll see this listed as plus E. And for the electron, you'll see this charge listed as minus E in some cases. And we often just think in terms of units of the elementary charge. So whenever you see this, for example, in a chemical formula, that's units of elementary charge. One of the reasons it's so important to think about the particles within the atom is that the counts of particles inside an atom really defined elements, isotopes, and ions. And we'll talk about what those terms mean a little bit later, but these counts of nuclear particles are key to cataloging the elements and understanding differences between the elements at the atomic level. The most important number, I would argue, for defining an element is the atomic number Z. And this is simply the number of protons in the nucleus. Hydrogen has one, helium has two, lithium has three, etc. Atomic number defines the elements. So all of the atoms of carbon, for example, that have ever existed and will ever exist have six protons in their nucleus. Having six protons in the nucleus is essentially the definition of carbon as an element. We also talk about the mass number, and this is typically given the letter A. Mass number refers to the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So we could say the total number of nucleons in the nucleus, right? Elements are defined by their atomic numbers, but can differ in mass number. And elements, <clears throat> elements are defined by their atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus, but Atoms of the same element can differ in their numbers of neutrons. And this leads to a difference in mass number with an equality in an atomic number. And atoms in that situation are called isotopes. And we'll look at isotopes in a little more detail a little bit further down the line. Now is a good point to mention element symbols because you'll commonly see mass number and, and sometimes atomic number embedded in kind of concise symbols for the elements. So of course, every element has one or two letters associated with it that serves as a shorthand for the element. And so we often don't need to include the atomic number. For instance, when we see the letter C, that indicates carbon. When we see Li, that indicates lithium, for example. But because atoms of an element can have different mass numbers, if we want to refer to a specific isotope with a specific mass number, as we'll see in a bit, isotopes are really defined by their mass numbers and their elements, we use a superscript number to the left of the element symbol. So for example, to indicate the isotope carbon-13 with 13 nucleons in the nucleus, a total of 13 protons and neutrons, we use the symbol 13C, like this. And from this symbol, we can deduce things about the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So because this is carbon, again, we have six protons in the nucleus, and the mass number of 13 indicates that we must have seven neutrons in the nucleus, right? Since the total number of nucleons is 13, we've got six protons, and the balance, or the remainder, is neutrons, so seven neutrons. So the element symbol allows us to get a rich picture of the nucleus and understand distinctions between isotopes as well. So far, we've really focused in on neutral atoms, but atoms can have net electrical charge. And when they do, they're referred to as ions. Cations have fewer electrons than they have protons, and this leads to net positive charge. So for example, in a lithium cation, we have three protons, because three protons, the atomic number three, defines lithium as an element, but we only have two electrons. The protons are positively charged, and so contribute a charge of plus three to the atom. The electrons are negatively charged, so contribute a charge of negative two to the atom. If we add these together, we see that the atom has a net charge of plus one, and we indicate that in the symbol using a plus symbol in the upper right. And you can see that here in the element symbol. Anions have essentially the opposite situation. So if we look, for example, at something like F minus, we have nine protons, 
because nine protons defines fluorine as an element, we have 10 electrons. Nine protons give us a net charge of plus nine in the nucleus, and the 10 electrons around that nucleus correspond to a charge of negative 10. If we add these together, we see that the ion has an overall charge of negative one, and we indicate that in the symbol with this negative sign in the top right of the uh, atomic symbol. So anions have an excess of electrons relative to protons and a net negative charge. A little bit later, we'll see that there are patterns in some elements on the periodic table in the types of ions they form. And thinking about the numbers of electrons that we see here, in particular, these numbers 2 and 10 are particularly special, we can understand this trend in the charges of ions that form of the various elements.